All right, our next speaker kind of makes my job up here as an, introduction, as an introductory agent kind of superfluous, because uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows exactly who he is and everything he's done, but I'm still obligated to read about him. Um, Dan Barker served as a Christian preacher musician for 19 years before discarding his faith and becoming one of the nation's most prominent atheists. Dan was PR director for the Freedom From Religion Foundation from 87 to 04 and was elected co-president of the foundation with Annie Laurie Gaylor in 2004. He is a contributing editor to the Free Thought Today and is involved in the foundation's state and church lawsuits. He's the author of Godless, How an Evangelical Preacher Became One of America's Leading Atheists, and now president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Join me in giving a very uh, rabble-rousing, piratey welcome to Dan Barker. Well, hello, all you godless heathens and happy heretics. That's... That's how Annie Laurie likes to start each of our Free Thought Radio show. Do some of you listen to Free Thought Radio, podcast and online, on Air America? And uh, it's a blast because not only do we get to interview all these great people, and some of you whom we've interviewed are here in this audience, uh, but we get to, I, I have to read all their books in order to do this interview. So what a great job uh, to get paid for reading all these great books. But uh, if you want to help our show, um, I've run out of jokes. I have... I have about 50 really good, like, free thought religion jokes, but uh, we're on show number 185 now. So I keep asking people, send jokes and, so I can use them. And one of the most recent ones was Jesus went into a hotel and put three nails on the desk and said, could you put me up for the night? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't write that one, but somebody, some student did. This is, um, this is a, a seven or eight day tour for me. Last Saturday I landed in San Antonio, Texas and rented a car and this is event number 10 since last Saturday. Saturday was the fact. Free thinkers of Central Texas, about 250 people. It was a lot of fun. And Vic Stenger was there. Are you here, Vic, somewhere? He's hiding out there. Yeah. Um, and others and it was pretty amazing. They thought about 150 would be there. They had to bring in extra chairs. The next day in San Marcos at Texas State, uh, two events including a debate on can you be good without God with a local reverend preacher type guy who basically informed us that there really are not very many true Christians in the world. Uh, don't, blame, don't blame Christianity for Hitler because you know Hitler wasn't a true Christian. And then I said well then Stalin wasn't a true atheist, right? <laughs> if you can play that game, you know, anybody who's not. And so I, so I asked him, well, who's a true Christian? Was Martin Luther a Christian? And he said, no. I'd never heard anyone say that. Well, I said, was John Calvin a Christian? And he said, no. So apparently the only true Christians are him and his family and his six people in his church, I suppose. But um, that was a fun debate. Uh, I was in uh, Austin on Monday uh, and then in um, up in Denton and Arlington and um, Plano, Texas on Thursday. Thursday morning, Plano, Texas to debate Dinesh D'Souza. And it's this huge Preston Wood Academy, Preston Wood Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church. And um, it was like Carnegie Hall, this big auditorium with multiple cameras and big screens and I mean they must have millions of dollars and what do you call those cameras that go up and they move around in the air that kind of thing even you know they, and they had a full restaurant down in the basement and at Starbucks and you know it's just this huge like a city and they, the academy of high schoolers and college students were there for this debate and they had the big great God debate and it was webcast to like 20 other campuses around the state so it was a it, big fancy deal and uh, I was fortunate that I saw Vic Stenger in, the, in San Antonio because I, I bought another copy of his book, uh, The New Atheism, and he's got some quotes in here that totally demolished Dinesh D'Souza, and I read some of them, and Dinesh had really little to say about it, which was kind of nice. Uh, I, <laughs> also, when it came up to the resurrection, I got to talk a little bit about Bob Price. Are you still here, Robert, somewhere? So uh, your name came up as well. And uh, about a month ago, I debated um, paganism and Christianity. And, and then Richard Carrier, I used his name a lot. Where are you, Richard? You say, oh, down here. There you are. Good to see you. We keep seeing each other at these places uh, here and there. And we did a debate together, a team debate once against a Muslim. 
uh, in, uh, where was that? Dearborn, Michigan, yeah, that's a good Islamic uh, community there. Uh, but uh, I was able to play Dinesh against that audience. This is a Southern Baptist church, right? Dinesh is a Catholic, pro-evolution. In fact, I held up Dinesh's book and I said, Dinesh, you've got some wonderful things in this book. I really love that section where you defend evolution. I thought it was amazing how he, in three succinct pages, and you're so, you're so charitable, it, even though you disagree with Richard Dawkins on the God question, you really admire Dawkins when he sticks to biology, and Dinesh is going like this, and the audience is going like this. <laughs> and um, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun, and we had a big, you know, he's a good showman, actually. He's a, he's a good public speaker, and he, he knows how to talk succinct. So we had one of these kind of great sporting event kind of debates, which I think is going to be online pretty soon. Um, they webcast, and they say that you can watch the thing uh, online. And then, uh, what was that, Thursday? Thursday night in Oklahoma City, and then last night again in Oklahoma City at, uh, at um, uh, Oklahoma University. So it's been a fun time, and then tomorrow I'm going home, and then uh, I have another debate Thursday night in London on is God a delusion with a Muslim. It will be the third Muslim debate, a guy named Adam Dean who's an up-and-coming Islamic apologist or whatever um, who's going to argue not, that God is not a delusion. And two more debates, one on morality without God and another one on... Um, um, is the only stable government a theocratic government? And, a, and an Islamic guy is going to argue that's the only way you can have a stable world is if the government is run by theocracy. So if you have any jokes, keep them coming. <laughs> I do a lot of debates, and I did one, well, I did seven debates with this one guy. His name was John Rankin. And I've stopped. I stopped because at the final debate, he got up and he said, Dan is demon-possessed. <laughs> and I thought, well, I thought we were having this civil thing, and if he really thinks I'm demon-possessed, what's the point? But we did three nights in a row on uh, the contradictions of the Bible. Is the Bible reliable? And he set it up. He said, we're going to do three nights in a row in three different churches in uh, Connecticut. And um, so he said, Dan, I want you to bring your best, strongest Bible contradictions. And then I will respond to every single one of them, right? And so I did. I prepared like 10 for the first night. But then I knew that he would come back the next night with the answer, so I prepared 10 different ones for the next night, <laughs> for the next church. And then ten, so I had like 30 different, different examples of Bible contradictions. And to his credit, on almost all of them, he was able to come back with something. He hadn't done any homework. He didn't know what I was going to raise. He wanted to just show everybody they're not that hard to dismiss, you know. And he, he came up, you could come up, any of you in this audience could come up with some kind of an answer to a contradiction, especially the ones that have to deal with theology or, um, you know, with a, a, maybe a historical question. They can always say you're taking it out of context or you're not understanding the true meaning of the original words. Or, yes, it does say this here, but over here it says this, which mitigates that. You know, that you can always think of something to kind of make a contradiction that has a lot of words in it kind of go away, right? But I was surprised, and I guess I shouldn't have been because I used to be a fundamentalist. I was surprised that the contradictions that really bothered him the most, to which he had no answer, were the things that what you and I might think are insignificant. They had to do with numbers. The things that really got under his skin had to do with uh, contradictory numbers in the Bible. And he scratched his head. He, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of them here. He scratched his head and he said, you know, you got something there. There's, you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, he said. Of course, he's never got back to me. But the simple ones like um, how many s stalls did Solomon have in 1 Kings 4.26? Solomon had 40,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. But in 2 Chronicles 9.25, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Well, we can see that that's probably a scribal mistake. 4,000 or 40,000, big deal, right? I mean, somebody made a mistake. But if you're a fundamentalist Christian, the Bible has no mistakes. It can't have any errors like that. And 
when I was a preacher, and even Hector Avalos says that he thinks one of the most effective ways to prove error in the Bible, just to prove it, is to use these numbers things. And um, because the Bible to the fundamentalist is completely inerrant. There's no mistakes in it at all. I know not all Christians are like that. I know that there's moderates and there's liberals who have a totally different idea, and it doesn't bother them. You know, most Catholics aren't bothered by what the Bible says or doesn't say. It's just that narrow branch of fundamentalists like me, um, like Richard Dawkins says in the foreword to my book, Godless, Dan wasn't just a preacher. He was the kind of preacher you would not want to sit next to on a bus. <laughs> I was that guy. I was that guy on campus or wherever, uh, and you've, you've seen that guy, haven't you? who has these answers, I just knew that you, you were secretly starving and you didn't know it until you met someone like me. It was your lucky day when God directed you to sit next to me on a bus because it's not by accident. And after a while, I would look at you and say, um, excuse me for saying this, but I can see you having some real troubles in your life now, aren't you? How does he know? You're struggling, you're having a problem with a personal relationship in your life right now, aren't you? And well, you know, I used to feel that way, and there's like, what's the meaning of life, and, and what's it all about, and you don't know, and you know, I, there's an answer. It's so easy, it's so crass, you know, to do that. It's just so obvious, but you know what? It works. If you want to be an evangelist, if you want to be a missionary, just do it. It actually works. Just say those st stupid things, and there's a lot of people who think, this must be from God. I better listen to this, and then it strikes some kind of a chord. Otherwise, how do you explain conversion? How do you explain the Mormons going over to England and going up to people on the street and telling them this story, the hill Camorra and the angel Moroni? And the, By the way, do you know there's an island, Camorra Island, with the capital of it is Moroni? Do you know that? Joseph Smith knew that. Um, uh, but um, how, how do you explain that they went up to these people and just said these weird things, and then the people went, Okay, and then they went to Utah with him. <laughs> they moved. You know, we laugh, but it works. It's been working for forever, for centuries, for millennia. This is working, this conversion thing. And so I was one of those guys who, you know, the Bible is absolute word of God. And before I left, I grabbed my Bible. I used to preach with this Bible. This is one of the two Bibles I used to preach with, just so that I could get the exact authentic. This is the authentic version from the King James, so we know it's the truth. Um, but um, for the fundamentalist Christian, and that's not every Christian, the actual inerrancy of the Bible is the most important thing. If the Bible has mistakes in it, then it falls. So if you're dealing with one of those kind of Christians, you can start off by just bringing some of these obvious numerical mistakes. For example, 2 Kings 8.26 Verses Second Chronicles 22.2, King Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem one year. Versus uh, King, um, where's the other one? He was, 20, he was 42, 22 verses 42. Then there's another one, Jehoiakim was... 18 years old when he became king and reigned in Jerusalem, but in Chronicles it says he was eight years old. So these are obvious, 18 verses eight. You can see that a scribe probably made a simple mistake. Even Norman Geisler admits in some of his books defending the Bible that, guess what, these numerical things actually, they're mistakes. Even he says that, because there, there, there's no wiggle room. You can't change what a number, what does the number mean? How do you interpret the number 22? So. <laughs> Even, even Geisler and others say, well, yeah, that was a mistake in the original documents. We have to admit, this ancient, they, they don't work. But Geisler says, that must have been a scribal error. So one of the two had to be correct over the other one. Now, we, we're all skeptics. And I think, as Joe was saying earlier, sometimes we skeptics are a bit over-eager. Sometimes we want to see and we want to, we want to make our point by... I'm, I've been guilty of that, wanting to maybe overstate the case, which uh, scholars warn against. Scholars even do it as well. But you've heard the claim that uh, there's a gross mistake in the Bible because the Bible gives the value of pi at what? 3.0. Well, does the Bible really do that? If we look in, um, and by the way, I'm going to 
I'm going to read this verse, and I'm going to suggest that perhaps that's not such a big problem. There's a, there's a bigger problem in that verse that's hidden that makes the inerrancy of the Bible less reliable. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, we have the description in the temple of these vessels that were made, and it's very detailed, and there was this big, huge, it was called a molten sea, and it was measured at 10 cubits across, there's a di diameter, and 30 cubits around, right? Uh, how long is a cubit? A cubit is about, it's kind of this, from here to the end of your hand. Maybe, it, it depends who's doing the measuring, right? Uh, maybe 50 centimeters or a half a yard. So we say, oh, look it, there's a mistake. God gave us the value of pi at 3.0. Well, of course, nobody can give you the value of pi. We have to round it off, don't we? 3.14159, whatever that is, is still rounded off. So some apologists suggest that, well, God was not which is rounding it off. This wasn't a blueprint from which they were going to purchase materials to measure. It was just an after-the-fact kind of casual description, and that's kind of close enough. Well, maybe... Others suggest that, um, you know, how long is the cubit? S suppose there were these two guys measuring. One guy went all the way around the outside, and he says, Hey, look, it came out to exactly 30. Wow. What measurement did you get, Shorty? You know. <laughs> and so, so Shorty measures, I got 10. You know, because there is some imprecision in how that could have been done, right? Others suggest that... Uh, the, the measurement was on the outside of the brim, but these, the uh, diameter was measured on the inside of the, of, from brim to brim. And they, actually, the Bible gives the, the width of that actual rim at a hand breadth. And a hand breadth is what, three, four inches? So it was this pretty big thing. This 10 cubits across, how, how far is that? That's uh, about five meters, right? So that's a pretty big, well, almost like a swimming pool, right? Um, that, thi that thing, and it's also described with these, these uh, 12 oxen around it. So it must have been, if it e existed at all, it must have been a pretty impressive thing there. It would have, maybe the length of the stage, how, is that about, you know, that five, five meters or so? So the, um, it, you could maybe defend this, 3.0 is just sort of a casual. We shouldn't be too hard to overstate that the Bible, Bible wasn't trying to make a mathematical statement about any of that. But there's um, a, a deeper problem in that verse. If you read further, it says that the amount of water within that vessel was 3,000 baths. That's how much water was contained in it. What is a bath? The bath was kind of the amount of water it took to take a bath in, right? Um, a Hebrew measure of a bath, and they've done some archaeology, and they found maybe that value could be as small as uh, maybe 20 liters and maybe as much as 40 liters, depending on, I guess, how rich you were or what. But a bath was sort of a measure, that, and they were trying to say how much water would fit in that. Well, no matter how you calculate the volume of that molten sea, what, what, what would it be called, a fountain or something? There's no way that 30,000 baths can fit in there. Even at the lowest value, 30,000, excuse me, 3,000, at the lowest value, um, that would give us about 60,000 liters of water. But if you calculate the volume, if it was spherical, if it was like a semi-spherical thing, if you calculate the volume, there's only room for about maybe 33,000, if you can do the math on that, 33,000 liters. So, that was way too big of a value. But maybe it was like a cylindrical thing, like, um, like one of those big backyard swimming pools. Maybe if you calculate the volume of that, well, that still only comes out to about 48, 49,000 liters. So at the lowest end, 60,000 was still too much to fit in there. So that seems like a problem, but there's an answer. And the answer requires knowing that the Bible actually contradicts itself. Second Chronicles that I, that I just referred to was written later. It was written after the Babylonian captivity. The Chronicles were rewriting, the, in fact, retelling earlier stories. That's why you find many stories twice in the Bible. You will find them given once and then given again. And you can compare them and you can find scribal mistakes in those things. 
But Second Chronicles was updating or rewriting something that had been written much earlier in 1 Kings. If you go to 1 Kings 7, 23 through 26, you find the exact same story. The same story. Here's this 10 cubits and 30 cubits, and it's a hand breadth width, and it's five, uh, five cubits tall. It gives you those dimensions, and so on, and the oxen and all that. But in 1 Kings, it says, to fill it up, you only need 2,000 baths. So there you go. There's the Bible contradicting itself, and yet we can, we can actually use that information not only to figure out which one of those two is right, but actually which is the more likely shape of that thing, if you think about it. The, um, the 2,000 figure actually, if you take the low end of what a bath is, the volume of a bath is, and if you take the high end of the cylindrical fountain, then it works because then you would come out to like 45,000 and then that's between 45 and 49,000. So First Kings is more likely to be right. First Kings is more likely to have got it right. Um, and wh whoever wrote Second Chronicles, who made that numerical mistake, who changed it from 2,000 to 3,000, is most likely the person who got it wrong. Unless they changed their bathing habits while they were in Babylon and were taking much smaller baths or something and he wanted to modernize the, uh, the story. Um, so I think that's fascinating. You can, you can complement the, the believers in the Bible by saying, yes, there is an answer. It does make sense, but you have to, it requires that one of them be wrong. So sometimes um, a good way to show that there's outright error or, or lies in the Bible is to use numbers. Because the Bible is filled with all these exaggerations that couldn't have been true. For example, there's the story in um, 2 Samuel. Uh, you, you know the story when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant? Where is that Ark, by the way? Um, people sometimes ask me, what would it take for you to believe? What would it take? You know, they never ask what would it take for them not to believe, but they're always asking as atheists, what would it take? And one of the examples I give is, well, okay, if Jesus were to materialize here on this stage and we could all catch it on videotape and you all saw it, and we all weren't uh, walking, dreaming. Um, and if Jesus were to give us the exact geographical coordinates in the Holy Land, where we would dig eight, 18 feet underground and find that Ark of the Covenant, I would change my mind. At least, I would, at least my evidence would flip. I would say, oh, that's good. Atheism is excruciatingly falsifiable. Uh, any number of things would falsify what we, we believe if evidence would come truth. If, uh, the success rate of prayer, for example, or any prophecy that we could verify was a true prophecy that no one could have known. There's all sorts of things that you could even invent that would cause you to change your mind. But ask them what would cause them to change their mind. Um, and they rarely, they, they might mumble something. During a debate, they might say something. Well, if you could prove to me that the resurrection did not happen. I said, oh, really? And then you would become an atheist? Of course they wouldn't, but. Um, the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant and it was taken away, but then it was being brought back to Israel. Their ark, their precious thing, to worship their God, the ark of the holy, you know? It's being brought back, and as it was being brought back in, into their area, it passed by this town called Beth Shemesh. And I think Beth Shemesh is from a Babylonian. I think Shamash was a Babylonian god of light or fire. Does anybody know that? Is that true, Richard? Uh, something like that, anyway. Which may explain why the writer of the Hebrew Scriptures um, treated this village or town so badly. Uh, but they were coming th into this town of Beth Shemesh and there were farmers who saw the ark coming back. And the farmers said, it's back, wow, it's returned. And they came up to it and they ran up to it and they, um, they opened it and praise Jehovah, praise Yahweh, whatever they said back there, praise. What? By the way, I just got an email from a guy two days ago. Uh, He's an Israeli living in Hebrew, and he's written a book in Hebrew. He thinks the first atheistic book in Hebrew in Israel called Hear, O Israel, There Is No God. And uh, he might translate it into English, but I think that might be a pretty powerful book. But in any event, these farmers looked at this ark and, oh, praise Jehovah, praise Yahweh, praise whatever they said. Uh, they, they rejoiced to see it. And guess what happened? Do you know that story? They, uh, they weren't supposed to look at it. You weren't supposed to look at the ark that was violating God's law. 
So these farmers were struck dead for doing this. But not only these farmers, 50,000 people in Beth Shemesh also were killed. The Bible says 50,000 people. And we'll come to that number in a minute, but can you imagine what kind of deity that is? Suppose, suppose one of my kids wrote me a birthday card that says, Daddy, I love you, but they spelled love L-U-V, and I said, you made a mistake. You didn't properly worship me. You have to be punished, and 50,000 people in Springfield have to die because I wasn't properly worshipped. I mean, who could, who could honor such a monster who has to be worshipped like that? But putting aside the moral question, doesn't that number seem a little strange? Were there any towns or villages in that area in that time of history that had 50,000 people in them? As far as I can tell, the, even Jerusalem at that time of history had maybe four or 5,000 people in it, in the whole city of Jerusalem. So obviously that's an exaggeration. And biblical literists have to do something in their brains to say how in the world did 50,000? 50, 50,000 is obviously an exaggeration. It's like one of these epic tales of what happened, right? And to prove how God is. And, and maybe it's a way of saying, don't look behind the curtain. Don't look for the ark because there's nothing there. Um, maybe that was the way of scaring people not to look too closely at their religion. But in any event, 50,000 people could not have been killed in that one city or village or whatever it was. We find examples of other wartime bragging in the Bible that um, Gideon, for example, to prove how powerful God is, Gideon had this big army, right? But then God said, it's too many. He looked down at the Midianites, and it describes them as, it was like locusts across the land, like the grains of sand on the beach. They were, he was supposed to go kill all these people, right? And yet God said, your army is too big. And you know the story how Gideon had to pare it down to 300 people, and then he went out with trickery. Um, Might have happened. Um, but the numbers they give of the people that were killed... In, in some of the stories in Judges, 42,000 people were killed in one day. In Judges 20, 21, another 22,000 Israelites were then killed. 22,000 Israelites in that one day. And a couple of verses later, another 18,000 were killed. And in, and in 2035, 25,000 Benjamites were killed in that day. But here's the uh, winner. Um, Judges 8, 10, Gideon, uh, talking about Gideon, in one day... 120,000 Ephraimites were killed. 120,000 in one day. That's what the Bible says. So what did they do? They, they all just stand there and go, you know, and how, were there even that many people? Obviously, that's an exaggeration. In the entire American Civil War, the entire count of the Union deaths over that entire period was 110,000, approximately. And this was with bullets, right? This is with more advanced warfare. We're supposed to believe that 120,000 Ephraimites were killed in one day. So obviously, and there's many other examples in the Bible. Um, 1 Samuel 4.10, 30,000 Israelites died. That would pretty much do it for that whole tribe, wouldn't it? And, uh, the, uh, and then in 2 Samuel 3, um, 8.5, another 22,000 people were killed in that one day. So obviously this is exaggeration, this is bluster, this is military bragging, this is like rewriting history to say, look how great our God is. And what is an exaggeration if not a lie? I mean, isn't an exaggeration an untruth? The Bible is filled with a lot of untruth. And liberal Christians will just look the other way and say, yeah, there's a lot of exaggerations and, and there are a lot of metaphor, there's a lot of parables. Just like when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, nobody thinks Jesus was referring to an actual person. He doesn't even have a name, right? He's just the prodigal son. There's a clue right there that it's not a real person. It's a story and no one, no one faulted Jesus for making up this story. You don't call that a lie. Even as a Christian, I would think Jesus made up a story to, tell, to make a point, right? He's just, he, if, and if he can make up stories, well, maybe the ancient Israelites made up the story about Adam and Eve. In fact, during the debate with Dinesh D'Souza, after I praised him about evolution, and he's a theistic evolution, um, somebody asked a question of him, well, 
if evolution is true, what does that do to the story of Adam and Eve? And boy, did he have to waffle. He had to say things like, um, you know, there probably was an, an Adam and an Eve. Even though the word Adam isn't really a name, it just means, you know, the earth or whatever, the, out of the earth or the first man. Um, and he said there probably were other humans before, just like evolution teaches, uh, whatever our mitochondrial Eve was, whoever she was, there were, she wasn't the first human. So he had to say things like that, which made that audience very, very uncomfortable. But um, just as the early Israelites may have just made up the story of Adam and Eve as a metaphor to explain origins, and why not? If Jesus can make up stories, well, then so could the ancient Israelites make up stories to to exaggerate and to make their points. Well, that part of my process as in deconverting was to realize that, well, if there's all these parables and metaphors in the Bible, then maybe God himself is a metaphor. Maybe the big God creature himself is one huge figure of speech. So uh, I think I caught Dinesh with his pants down a number of times. By the way, um, I, in order to prepare for that debate, I went, I looked at the video of our debate at Harvard that we did last year with um, Greg Epstein, the humanist ha chaplain at Harvard. By the way, he's got a new book out, um, Good Without God, whom we interviewed for today's radio show. Today's radio show is with him. Um, and as I w watched the debate, I had forgotten that Dinesh had said something during that debate at Harvard, and I jotted this down. He said, I am an agnostic too. There's no way we can know if God exists, and we can't know if God exists. I admit it. But so many people believe in the world, there must be something to believe. And the three arguments he gave for God were just this, the basic, um, you know, the first cause. The Big Bang started with the singularity, which was where I was able to use Vic Stenger's remarks about how he's misquoting Hawking's on, on the singularity. Hawking says there was no singularity now, although Dinesh is trying to say that he really did prove there was one, right? And he, he still, Dinesh is still stuck back in the 1970s. The second point was the fine-tuning of the initial constants, which is, is a real easy one to address. And his third one was the resurrection. And uh, he got up and he said, the only viable hypothesis that skeptics have about the resurrection of Jesus is that they all hallucinated. That's what he thinks. That's what he thinks the scholarship says. And there are some, that is one possible hypothesis about what happened. I mean, hallucinations do happen, but that's not the only or even the main hypothesis. I think most scholars lean towards legend, at least, and even some towards myth. I tend to lean more towards myth now than I used to before, that there probably never was even a historical Jesus. But um, it was fun to play that stuff against that Southern Baptist audience. And part of the discussion also centered on morality, where the... Um, where I made the claim that if, if God belief gives you greater morals, then why is there no empirical fruit of that? Why is there such feeble empirical fruit for that? Why are you Christians no different from non-Christians? And I cited the examples that um, on all of these studies, even, even the ones done by George Barna, who himself is a born-again Christian, complaining that we Christians aren't any better, uh, divorce. Do you know in the, what religious group has the highest divorce rate in the entire country? But which group, actually? No, it's not Catholics, by the way. Southern Baptists. Southern Baptists have the highest divorce rate in the nation, and I was able to point that out to that audience, and also to point out that the average clergy in America is more likely to be divorced than the person sitting out in the pew, and the studies that show that in spite of all of our parents, religious or not, admonishing our kids to be wise in their sexual practices, in spite of the fact that Christian and Southern Baptist parents tell their children, and there's a lot of teenagers out there, and they got very quiet when I was saying this. Um, in spite of the fact that you're, and, you know, you're preaching abstinence, there's actually no difference. Teenagers are teenagers. There's no difference in the, the amount of teenagers who are having premarital sex, who believe in God, and those who don't. The only difference is that the ones who are more religious are using less birth control and therefore are more likely to risk getting disease and being pregnant. And boy, was that room quiet. Um, <laughs> there, were, there were 13 to 18-year-olds in there, and I think maybe some 20-year-olds. But uh, So there is no difference. There's no basic, you know, um, the, the danger of religion is that you'll close your eyes to the real world. 
So I think if you're dealing with a fundamentalist Christian, people always ask me, Dan, when you were a fundamentalist, what could I have said to you? And by the way, where were you guys? <laughs> Why did everybody respect me? Why didn't one of you come up and say something? Did you, were you just afraid? Were, you know, um, maybe I just didn't have the good luck to meet someone like you, but, but come up to us fundamentalists. Come up, that, it does make a difference. I mean, if you had come up to me, I'll tell you two things you could have told me. Uh, if you'd come up to me, I wouldn't have deconverted on the spot. I wouldn't have said, oh my gosh, silly me, there's no God. But, <laughs> but I, would have, I would have respected, and, and I'm only speaking for fundamentalists, okay? They're not all like I was. Most of the moderates and liberals are much nicer and much more understanding about things than that. But if you, want to, if you are talking with a fundamentalist, remember that the fundamentalist mindset is absolutistic. It's, it's black or white, hot or cold, yes or no, right or wrong. Even in the Bible, Jesus said, you should be cold or hot because if you lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. So when you're talking to a fundamentalist, you're talking to a binary brain, right? So the Bible, this word of God has to be true or false. It's inerrant. It's perfect to those kind of Christians, right? Which is, which is why pointing up some of the obvious mistakes that are in here is so distressing to fundamentalists and why they dig in so hard to defend this book because without this book they feel like we're ships without, an, without a rudder. So if you could have responded to me with something about the Bible not being reliable, that pulls the whole rug out from under them because without the Bible and its reliability they've got nothing. They're going to have to give up their faith or turn into liberals, uh, liberal <laughs> believers lukewarm, who God wants to spit out of his mouth. But, um, so, I'm not suggesting you have to become a Bible scholar, but you can learn a few Bible contradictions. You can learn a few points like this and have some of them ready and say, because I imagined, when I was a fundamentalist preacher, I imagined that all you needed to do was just, just open this and read it, right? Just, the, it, it, the truth will be so obvious to you if you'll just do it. And if you come back and say, well, I've done that. I have done, I've done exactly what you've asked me to. I've res I'm respecting you. You're asking me to read the Bible? Okay, I read it. I respect it. And look what I found. Like Mark Twain who said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. <laughs> but the, um, that would have impacted me. It wouldn't have converted me, but that would have made an impression on my fundamentalist mind that you actually did read it and you were actually able to say something intelligent about it. And I might have argued with you, of course. The big one is you're taking it out of context. You hear that all the time. But um, if anybody's taking in anything out of context, look at the context in which early Christianity arose. Look at that context. They seem to think that Christianity just sort of plopped. It was delivered by the stork. It just kind of, there it was with no evolution, no ancestors, no any of that. It just sort of popped into the world. Uh, they're the ones taking things completely out of context by ignoring that first century and first century BC in, in previous context of how their, uh, their myth originated. So coming back with the Bible is an important thing to do with fundamentalists. Uh, the second thing is morality, because as a fundamentalist, I thought the only way to be a good moral person is through the Bible and God's word. And if you could show that there are a lot of good people who don't believe in God who are doing good things, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who would say she, she was an atheist, she had no belief in a God and yet she had meaning and purpose in her life. Susan B. Anthony called herself an agnostic. She was not as outspoken as her friend, uh, but in the same way they, they, they cared about real things in the real world. Um, show, show the hospitals that have been built by atheists. The Oxner Clinic in uh, New Orleans in, in southern Louisiana was built by two atheists from, was founded by two atheists from Baraboo, Wisconsin. And um, one of our members of our group, uh, Dr. Watley, who just died a couple weeks ago, founded a woman's clinic in Alabama. Point to the good things that non-believers are doing. Point to the lack of agreement among believers about their supposed moral principles. So you take any moral issue that we're struggling with right now in the world, you name it, um, gay marriage, um, doctor-assisted suicide, what are some others, abortion rights, the war, stem cell research, you name any of these issues that the, the society is struggling with, and you will find devout, Bible-believing, praying, church-going, good people on both sides of those issues. There's no moral absolute. 
They, they're, they march in opposite march with each other, and then they go back to the same churches and pray to the same God and read the same Bible. So there is no, Paul said in the Bible, if the, if the trumpet is an uncertain sound, who's going to march? Paul said the, that God is not the author of confusion. But who can think of a book that's caused more confusion than the Bible, really? They're all over the place. So um, the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible is important to fundamentalists, and, the, and then morality, showing that you don't really need the uh, biblical or any religious system to be a good moral person. Now, I have a lot more to say about numbers and that, but I'm going to stop it there because I'm saving it for an article. And maybe we'll do questions about the foundation or um, uh, any, other, any other things. We can go home now. Oh. Well, I can't see from here. The lights are. Yeah. For the purpose of film, could I repeat the question so that we get it on tape? <laughs> oh, I guess I guess somewhere back here. Okay. Oh, he, he's asking, how old would I recommend that a child be that you start giving them religious instruction without it being classified as child abuse? It probably varies with, this, with the child, but we do know that around the age of 12 or 13, with girls it's around 12 and with guys it's around 13, you start to get that abstract mind. Before that, your mind is not quite up to the adult level of being able to think in abstracts. So maybe there's a good point. Um, in the Catholic Church, the age of reason is seven. Have you seen Julius Sweeney's play, by the way, where you reach the age of reason? Uh, that was funny. But, um, you know, when we raised our daughter, Sabrina, Annie, Lori, and I um, have one, one daughter. She's 20 now. She's away at college. We didn't, like, we didn't indoctrinate her in atheism. We didn't, like, sit her down and make her memorize Bertrand Russell and, <laughs> and, 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 and fill out a little chart of atheism. You know, none of that. She was just raised free, you know, and she heard us talking. She's really lucky, though, because in Madison, Wisconsin, it's so liberal that the, um, and just this term, she's finally realizing how lucky it's been because she's, she's living away from home, and she's shocked at what the real world is like out there. But through her whole schooling, the, the Christians in, in Madison, Wisconsin, were always a little minority in all of her classes. She always had three or four atheist friends and non-believing Jewish friends and that, and I heard Sabrina talking to one of her friends three or four years ago, and they were kind of whispering, and they said, Sarah goes to church. <laughs> and they, they were looking over at her, she, she does, yeah, she goes to church on Sunday. They were like, she was a freak, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not like that in Springfield, is it? Uh, it's, <laughs> so, so we've been very lucky. Uh, and, and, and Annie Laurie's mother, Ann Gaylor, who's the founder of the she and Annie Laurie are the co-founders of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Ann Gaylor says, her philosophy is that you can't raise children. Children raise themselves. Parents are facilitators. We provide an environment and food and protection and some advice and that. But, but did any of us think we were being raised? Didn't we all just raise ourselves? And uh, so they must pretty much let the kid think their own thoughts and do whatever they wanted. And, and Anne did a pretty good job. I married one of her kids, you know. They turned out pretty nice without any of this overt, hovering parenting. And um, a few years ago, when Sabrina was maybe 12 or 13, I just wanted to make sure. You know, parents get kind of nervous. Uh, you know, you, you're your own person. You, just because we're atheists doesn't mean you have to be an atheist. And um, she listened. And, uh, you know, atheists... A child of an atheist family like Dawkins is, is not an atheist child. They're their own child. And so if you want to be religious, you're free, Sabrina. You know, if you want it, I mean, we're not telling you what you have to think. As long as it's your own thoughts and you can defend them, and we might argue with you, but, you know, you're welcome and free to have. If you want to be a born-again Christian someday, you know, you're free to do that. And she looked at me and she said, Oh, Dad. <laughs> Sit 
I really can't see any hands from here because it's so this light. Oh, oh. That's a good idea. Oh, that's a thought, huh? That's been suggested. Who would be the actor? Hank Larry Swank. Hank Larry Swank. <laughs> I'll have to go with somebody else. Um, but, um, but I'm not that, I'm, I'm unusual, but there's a lot of stories. I know at least 25 other former clergy who are now atheists and agnostics. In fact, I know some atheist clergy who are still in the pulpit right now. I get emails from them and they use pseudonyms. And they're desperate and they're, they're suffering. And Daniel Dennett has been doing a study. He's finished it now. Um, he's doing a study of atheists in the pulpit. And he and Linda Lascola asked me to try to find and I get the emails from them. There was a big article last year in Psychology Today in which I was featured as one of the examples of an atheist who left. And so I hear from these guys, and one guy's in North Carolina, and he doesn't know what to do. He's not trained for anything, and he hasn't told his family yet, and he's preaching, and he's, he's, he says, I'm an atheist now. This is nonsense, but what do I do? And uh, once a month, he sneaks over to Nashville. He thinks he's going to sell some songs. You know, maybe, maybe he can, but, uh, and there's others like that. So Daniel Dennett and Linda Lascola, the psychologist, actually visited seven of these guys, they're actually in the pulpit now, and they're actually atheists and don't believe, and how do they feel? And they've finished the article, and he's looking to have it published in a major periodical or publication, and then maybe draw out some more. So um, there's a lot of stories like that. After they leave, a lot of them teach philosophy. Delos McCown and Pat McGuire did that. Some of them sell insurance. That's a good fit. Um, <laughs> Some of them go into social work. Tom Reed was a Mississippi Catholic priest who joined the priesthood because he wanted to help people, and that's why he left the priesthood. He thought the church was hindering, and now he's a social worker. He looks like a priest. He talks like he's just got this avuncular kind of priestly look, but he's, a, he's an outspoken atheist. So there's a lot of stories like that out there. But, but if, you, if you have some money... Um, sure, okay, where are you? His question has to do with roadside crosses. What can we do about it? Um, in fact, we have complained about it, and some of our members have actually gone out and pulled them out of the ground. One of them was uh, stopped by the police saying, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm helping you. I'm cleaning up this roadside hazard. And uh, he, he wasn't arrested, but he was charged with um, some kind of a crime, and they, they couldn't think of the crime to charge him with uh, in Colorado. And uh, eventually it's something about desecrating a holy object or something. I don't know what it was. But he, he beat that rap really easy. But uh, I know people who put those things in their trunk. And you have to make sure it's actually on public property because some properties right up next, some of these crosses are on the farmland itself. So you might have to know um, uh, exactly. And it, it's, it, there's mixed feelings there because you feel bad for those people. And you, there was a tragedy and they, they want some way to remember that spot as if that made any difference but uh, it is illegal I think in every state I think it's illegal for private people to put I don't think you can even get a permit for some of that property so um, maybe maybe the easiest thing to do is complain call the city or the county and say or the state and say hey well, this is here this should be removed this is a hazard you know what if I had to pull over and this was there so and mowing they have to mow around it yeah well, because nobody wants to interfere with somebody's private grief, so. Oh, I see that cell phone waving in the back. That's a good trick. <laughs> Is there an index of some of the most obvious numerical um, 
I don't know. I've just been going through on my own and digging around. There might be. I guess we could do that. It's more fun to actually hold this book and, you know, do that kind of stuff. But um, I don't know if there is. Well, when I finish this article, then I'll have a good chunk of them that we can use. Exaggerations like who, who could actually live 969 years? Maybe. Maybe that happened. Is there any scientific possibility that that would have happened 969 years? Um, but all you need is one for a fundamentalist. Show it to them. Show them, um, which ones did I give you today? 2 Kings 8.26 versus 2 Chronicles 22.2. One of them says he was 22, the other one says he was 42. So there's one example. And Hector Avalos has written a book in Spanish. Uh, Se puede decir si Dios existe. And he he's mentions the numerical ones in there. And in, in the Spanish-speaking community, they're very powerful because how can there be that kind of a mistake? Seems silly to you, doesn't it? That a numerical mistake would be that important. Yeah? Yeah, the question is, how do fundamentalists actually prove that the Bible is the word of a God as opposed to stories? Well, it's faith, and if there is a God and he communicates to us through writing, well, then why not this book? Well, of course, there's good reasons why not this book, but that's how I used to think. What a special way. God works in wond wondrous ways that are not expected, and a book is an unexpected way to do it. Of course, was it Dawkins or who pointed out that it would have made more sense if he had engraved the Ten Commandments not on the those stone tablets, but on the moon, <laughs> where we could all just look at them, right? Where are they? Um, somebody remind me who said that. That was a good line. Um, but um, it's, it's a presuppositionalist idea. Uh, if there is a God, then he would communicate to us through some means, and, here's, and we have this, right? And there's a church that exists, and there are people who swear their lives have been changed by it. And when I used to read this book, I would feel, I would actually open this book and read it, and I would cry sometimes. I would get goosebumps. So, I mean, there's a, uh, there's a spiritual proof. In fact, if you ask Mormons what's the proof of their religion, they say, read the Bible and you'll feel it. That's basically what they say. Just, you'll just feel it. And, and they know that a lot of people are going to open it and start reading, and they're going to start feeling things. I didn't realize it back when I was a believer, but getting goosebumps from reading the Bible, that's actually proof of evolution. Because what good are goosebumps? What good are they? Why do we have them? Well, we all know that our ancestors were more hairy than us, and, and they used, for thermal equilibrium, they would raise up their fur or to appear larger to a predator or to scare off another, the alpha male can make himself look big, right? Well, when we get scared or cold, look what happens. Totally useless, and there's an evidence right there on our skin that we evolved from, from humanoid or ape-like ancestors. Okay, here's a, I can see that hand, okay. She was a former fundamentalist herself, and often now when she's talking with believers, they accuse her of having had a false conversion. You mean a false conversion to Jesus? Yeah, I get that all the time. They say, Dan, you never were a true Christian because if you really knew Jesus like I do, then you could never leave, right? And I respond, well, I used to preach that, and I used to feel that, and I used to get the goosebumps, and I used to feel this prayer. In fact, I can still do it today. I can still speak in tongues, right? I'm not going to do it right now, but I'm not going to. No, I, I wouldn't do it. It's embarrassing. It's like asking you to make the sexual noises from your last marriage. I mean, it's like... I wouldn't. But, but I can do that, and sometimes just to try it, like once or twice a year, I'll actually do that, and I'll speak in tongues, and suddenly my mind goes into this mode, and it's pretty amazing. I, I don't know if it's a left brain, right brain thing. I don't know what it is, and I know that there's been some studies, but it's real. It really happens. The mystical experience... 
is powerful, and I had it, and I, would, I, would, I can still do it now as an atheist. I can go into that mode, and I can feel this like a parent figure right about here, and this peace that passes understanding, and a joy like, wow, this is great. Uh, it's similar to like maybe when you're playing music or when you're making love or, you know, there's, there are chemicals. They know that the cerebellum is hit with certain dopamines and chemicals and things when you're eating chocolate. And when you're doing a good deed, did you know that? When you do a good deed for somebody, there's a little bit of a kick. When you're laughing, there's this. So there's some kind of a something that chemical that must be going on in the brain because it feels great. And when I was a fundamentalist Pentecostal preacher, I thought, boy, who could possibly deny the power of God? So maybe you had experiences like that too, that you knew and you felt like this voice in you. And, and uh, in my book, I make the argument that if I was not a true Christian, then nobody is. If I was faking it, then so are you. You could say that. I thought it was real, and you think, but you actually don't know. The Bible even says, he who comes to God must believe that he exists in Hebrews. You can't know it. You have to believe it, right? So they don't really know it. Like Dinesh admitted, I'm an agnostic. I can't know if God exists or not. But like Blaise Pascal, who was also a Catholic agnostic, he says, I think we're going to believe anyway. So um, you can say those things. They're probably not going to believe you, but you can say those things. And by the way, what does the Bible say? How do you judge who's the true Christian? By the fruits. You shall know them by their fruits. So who are you to judge me? It was my fruits. You know, my fruits exhibited the gifts of the Spirit and the love and the joy and all that stuff. So how arrogant of you to tell me that I wasn't a true Christian. Uh, I left because I know what I'm doing, and I left because of good intellectual reasons. That's why, not because... Sometimes they ask, what went wrong? What was the bitterness? Was there some bitterness in your life? You know, as if they could tinker with that one little thing, and then, oh, I'd go back to being a Christian. Um, and they, or else, what was the secret sin you were struggling with? You hear that a lot. Um, what, you know, it, some of my friends were telling me, Dan, usually apostasy has to do with a moral issue you're struggling you, you just don't want any moral restrictions on your life and God and so you don't want God telling you what to do you really want to be free I did this debate in Delaware about 10 years ago Doug Wilson he's this Calvinist um, nut actually um, and you probably know him he's the guy who answered uh, answered a Christian nation he wrote the book in answer to Harris uh, and we did this huge debate two-hour debate and it was really exhausting and at the end of the debate a guy came up to the front, and I thought I'd heard every, Christ, every question in the world. I thought, by now, of course, there's nothing new. Well, this guy came up and said, so, Mr. Barker, what I want to know is, are you a practicing homosexual? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized later, you always, the next day you realize what you should have said. Uh, I should have said, um, I mumbled something about... Um, no, but I wouldn't be ashamed of it. I didn't want to like try to distance myself from gays. I want if I if I were, I would be. I would admit it. But what does that have to do with the debate? You know. But I realized what I should have said was, no. But now that I've met you, Yeah, the question is, is the money we're spending on billboards worthwhile? Well, we're trying it. It's an ex... All right, well, there you go. Look at this um, carrier here. Not Richard, but this carrier here. Um, <laughs> they gave me this, and they gave Victor one of these in San Antonio. They had a billboard up there, uh, Don't Believe in God, You're Not Alone. And the canvas from that, they cut into pieces and they made these things. And, and I think that's the bottom of the E, of one of the E's, but isn't that cool? Um, but um, um, members of our group donate money for that. And so as a nonprofit group, you have to spend the money on what it's given for, right? There are a lot of atheists and agnostics who want that message out there. We tried it. Uh, I think we were the first in the U.S. to have billboards up. We actually had bus signs up way back in the 70s, uh, just for a week. But... Um, it caught on. People liked it. They saw it and they said, I want one in my town. And uh, that woman from Wichita is here, right? You had one. Uh, yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, okay. It was, um, that was the praise Darwin involved beyond belief. Okay. With Bill, in St. Louis. Okay. 
Oh, Topeka, that's right. And then there's beware of dogma, imagine no religion, um, then keep religion and government separate. We had one in, in Grand Junction, Colorado last month, keep religion out of government that was up. And about three days later, somebody crossed out the word religion and, and spray painted black letters, fags, on it. So, um, and we got pictures of that. But then, so the company replaced it for us. And the effectiveness of it, um, if, we're, if, you, if you're measuring the effectiveness monetarily, often they don't pay for themselves. But a nonprofit group isn't a profit for, for a profit group. We pick up new members, but what usually happens is the billboards themselves are somewhat effective, but what's more effective is the resultant publicity from it, the newspaper stories, the TV stories from it. And these TV reporters are really fun. It's like this, the atheists are coming, and they make this big visual. <laughs> All across the, val the Phoenix Valley, there are five billboards, and here's what they say. It's like a big story. It's kind of cool to watch the stories. And um, we, uh, the publicity from it, like our, our sign in Olympia, Washington last year, Bill O'Reilly got really mad at us when that happened. And he, he went after us for three nights in a row on national TV, uh, the attack on Christmas. And um, it was wonderful. We got all these calls. We feel like putting a plaque to Bill O'Reilly on our building. <laughs> people, people call us and said, anybody that he hates, I'm joining your group, you know. <laughs> uh, And when we set that sign up there, I thought it was just going to be a little meeting with like 20 of And there were about 20 of our members that showed up. We were going to dedicate this, the, the winter solstice sign there. But when we came around the corner, there were all these TV cameras and newspaper. It was a big deal that there was going to be an atheist sign in the Capitol. And the, that footage of me reading the sign was on the evening news. And then uh, Bill O'Reilly is in uh, Seattle. And so they saw that. And so he ran it, and then uh, Colbert Show ran it. If you saw the Colbert Show last December, he ran that same thing about the word, this attack. On, it was really funny what he did. So, um, so there's, there's that kind of publicity that comes from it. And our signs, we have members who think some of our signs are the Republic, drew the cartoon for us. He's the former Mormon. He's the grandson of Ezra Taft Benson, the former president of the Mormon Church. We're good buddies now, and we did this show called Tunes and Tunes. Well, he drew a picture of Santa Claus. Great jolly, rosy cheek Santa Claus with the red, and then there's this holly and everything saying, yes, Virginia, there is no God. <laughs> Those buses are going all around Seattle right now, and some people are crossing off the word no. Some people are getting an X-Acto knife. Coming. I don't know where they're doing it. They're cutting it off, and so they're vandalizing the signs. But there's a story there, right? There's a story of, you know, do we vandalize their signs, right? Do we barge into their churches, and do we, you know... But uh, they can't tolerate a little difference of opinion here. Um, so Bill O'Reilly lives in Seattle, and he's got to be seeing those signs. So I'm. <laughs> yeah, a lot. Uh. <laughs> By the way, when was the last time an atheist knocked on your front door? You know. <laughs> the atheist would say, I have some literature for you, and it's a blank page, right? <laughs> some Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door once, and we were arguing about the difference in theology. Is in, John, in, in, in John 1, 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was a God, they say, instead of God, right? Uh, people have been killed over that stuff. Servetus was killed over that uh, basic idea. Uh, and I said, oh, you guys know the Greek? And they said, well, yes, we know the Greek. And I said, oh, really? Well, then let's, ex let's explain it. And I went and I got my Greek text, and I opened it to John 1.1, 1, 1, and I handed it to the guy. I said, now explain it to me in the, in the, you know, the Greek. How, why are you saying it's a God? He didn't know it was upside down. <laughs> and his friend looked, uh, looked over at it, and he said, I think... The word God is that round circle with a line through it. And I said, you're right. You do know the Greek, right? They don't, they don't know anything, you know. It's, it was, it was a, a fun moment to embarrass. Uh, and they went back. And I said, why don't your scholars identify themselves? Why don't you Jehovah's Witnesses put their names on it? And they said, humility. They don't want anybody to know their name for humility. But um, a Jehovah's Witness, an older man and a little black boy who must have been six maybe, 
dressed up on a, on, a, on a summer day, dressed up in a suit and a tie, came standing beside him. So when they came to the door, I just ignored the man and I said, this is a Saturday. You should be out having fun with your friends. What are you going along with this nut old man? You know, you, you, why? you know, he's telling you lie. And he just got out of there really fast. You know, that poor little kid, poor little kid. Think what he has to do on this Saturday and he has to be a part of this cult. But um, you probably have better stories than I do about those things. All right, go ahead. No, I don't. Uh, her question was debating a Muslim. Uh, do I have to know something about the Quran and change the debate at all or temper anything out of fear? Um, no, and uh, if, if I was going to fear anything, it would be from a fundamentalist church as well, right? It's, it's the extremists in any group that are causing the violence. But at public debates, it's interesting, the dynamic is such that the people putting on this debate, they're wanting to put their best face forward. They're super, super nice at debates. Even if they violently disagree with you philosophically, they want to show how civil we are, right? So it's kind of nice going to debate with these people that are hostile to you because we're all wanting to show who's the nicest person, right? Who, who has the shortest horns, I guess, of what it would be. Um, but I, do, I did notice that um, when I mentioned the word Allah, didn't that happen to you, Richard? When we, when we mentioned Allah during the Muslim debate, they had to say this thing. What did they say back? Um, yeah, they had to, re you can't say the name of Allah without them, I, at first I thought they were dissing us, and, but then I realized there's, and all the women were on some, one side with the kind of, you know, veils and that, and the men could dress like they want over on this side, and I don't know if you remember in uh, Dearborn, we have a wonderful member of our group, uh, her name is Tracy, who used to be a man, I don't know if it's transsexual, transvestite, but real tall, strong handshake person, and she's the kind of, feminist person who really likes to overdress with these big beautiful flowery purple hats and all that. I saw her walk in the back of that room wondering where she should sit. Um, <laughs> should she sit over here with the women or with the veils or should she sit over with the guys? And she finally sat with the guys. I thought it was neat to see all that color out there uh, in the back. But after the debate in Queens uh, and and I read the Quran. You know, I'm, I'm no expert. I don't even know if I have the good English translation. Does anybody know what's the best English translation? I have two, but it, what's the best English? Or is there a best English? Oh, okay, well. It, and they will say that you have to know it in the original Arabic. Of course, most of them don't know Arabic either. But, but I read through the Quran, and I was surprised to learn that the organization of the surahs, you know what, they, you know what it is? It's just by size except for the introductory one, the longest one, and then they get shorter, shorter, and at the end, it's 114, it's just like three verses long, so they're just organized by size. After the debate in Queens, the organizer, Ali, I went up to Ali and I said, this has been wonderful. Uh, you people have been so nice and gentle and generous, and, and they gave me gifts and they fed me food, and I have this little trophy they gave me. I said, you people are so nice, and Ali looked at me and he said, well done. Allah commands me to be nice to you. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. I didn't say a word because I think you should judge people by their actions, right? And he was a good guy. But I was thinking, you mean you're actually forcing yourself? You're restraining yourself? You really want to, but Allah is telling you to be nice? And I'm supposed to think that's a compliment, you know? What if Allah told you to be cruel to me? Don't, isn't there anything about me that you kind of, like and admire as a person you're just you're just forcing yourself to be nice to me and I'm supposed to be impressed with that but um, uh, but no I haven't felt any you know um, any fear of my, once I had to walk through metal detectors to get on a TV show but that was because the, the host was so weird but um, but no it's actually very invigorating I think we're out of time here is that true JT where's JT oh thank you uh.